One of the ladies said, you know, when she finally opened her heart again, she realized, wow, I was raised by monsters and then I became one. That was her realization. Nobody told her to think that. She just saw what happened to her. Now. Hello and welcome to the Pacific Channel, where you learn about the law of attraction, how to manifest anything you want, meditation and more. In this video, Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about how you are not the victim of your genes, why energy healing techniques such as EMDR and EFT work so well, why people who overcome themselves doing the work with meditation don't want to change their past at all, and the choices you have if you are stuck in a dysfunctional family right now. You are not the victim of your genes. It's the environment that signals the genes. This is called epigenetics. Dr. Bruce Lipton and Dr. Joe Dispenza talk about this all the time. He gives the example of a mother and her baby and how the baby cells respond to those negative feelings of the mother. If the mother's angry or frustrated or upset, it can affect the baby. Most of us have been born into dysfunctional families or we end up in dysfunctional relationships. So what can we do about it? Dr. Joe talks about a couple healing modalities which can help, which uh, one is called EMDR and the other is called EFT. And he talks about how both of these modalities or healing techniques can deal with the programs that are stored in the body. He also talks about the choice you have to deal with current difficult situations, such as living in a dysfunctional family. But without further delay, let's listen to him. There's this concept in biology where if you look at the emotional state of both progenitors, both male and female, moments to hours to days before conception, that the emotional state casts the first genetic die, both in the what's called the haploid cells, the 23 chromosomes in the sperm and the 23 chromosomes in the egg, and that 46 chromosomes actually makes the human being. So the emotional state from the progenitors is telling the seed and the egg initially what to expect in the environment that the organism is going to be in. And so the selection and the instruction of the gene from the emotion is determined whether the organism is in survival. If it's in survival, well, make sure that it's prepared for the same environmental state, chemically, organ-wise, cell-wise, hormone-wise, better chance of survival if it adapts based on the first signal. When there's fertilization in the sperm and the egg, there's cross-linking that goes on and there's information from both male and female that are starting the process of the development of the embryo, ultimately into the fetus. The maternal blood flow of the mother is in direct contact through the placenta with the growing fetus. And her thoughts and emotions and even her behaviors are the second signal coming from the mother who's perceiving or at least interpreting the conditions in the environment. So once again, if there's fear, if there's anger, if there's poverty, if there's lack, if there's sadness, if there's pain, that's the information emotionally that's being fed to the child and it will actually sculpt and mold the clay of the organism. Sometimes a smaller head circumference, a smaller frontal lobe, larger adrenal glands, the body adapts for that environment. If the child is raised in or even conceived for that matter, instead of of the flesh, but of an elevated state of the spirit, then there's a different selection and instruction of genes. And the same happens to be for the pregnant mother influencing the growth of the child. Now, it isn't so linear that, you know, one stress response or a difficult few weeks has such a profound effect, but you get the idea that the exchange that's taking place biologically from the mother to the child also is preparing the child for the same environmental conditions. It's called genomic imprinting. After partition, after birth, then there are certain program gene expressions that we come preloaded with about our body size, our body shape, our eye color, you know, all that stuff, hair color, all these things, height, weight, all these things are just the kind of map of a combination of both parents. Maybe there's a dominant gene from one parent and a recessive gene from another. Maybe there's two dominant genes from both parents, you know. You get the idea that you come with a little bit of programmed gene stuff, but then the environment then has a strong play in our own personal development. So 
The challenge becomes then that we are raised by the very people that have contributed to us genetically. And because of mirror neurons and because of the state of the brain in the infant, the infant is gathering information from the environment through the mirror neurons to know how to behave, to know how to act, to actually model behaviors. And the mirror neurons are empathy neurons. And so it's not what you only say to your child, but it's how you show your child you're behaving. And the child is picking up in a very, very lucid dream state what reality looks like, and they will actually model behavior. That's why the terrible twos is the terrible twos. And if you yell at your kid from the time they're one year old to the time they're two year old, and you tell them to stop, and you're treating them a certain way when they turn two, they've just learned that behavior, and they're, they're showing you what you look like when you're upset. And that's just an immediate example of how the environment begins to once again, select and instruct the genes that we've been given from our parents. So if there's dysfunction in the family, and that's the basis for what the child knows to be the way to be, then it's completely understandable then that those programs tend to be encoded subconsciously. In other words, when the child's brain waves the first seven years of their life are in delta and theta and even alpha, low-level alpha, all the information is going in as the truth. It's going in unedited. And that's what starts the first layer of programs that we have as children. So the interpretation of love through the two or one person that's raising the child combined with some really unhealthy behaviors. And because it's combined with some very unhealthy behaviors, we think that's normal. As an example, we did this amazing program in a prison in Mexico City in, in the center of one of the worst, worst parts of Mexico City. And when I say worst, I mean it as the worst. And in a women's prison, and I think there were between 30 and 40 women there, and, and there were horrible conditions. And we sent two of some really special people to go in there. And of course, they could have been in survival as well, and but they overcame their environment beautifully. And one of the ladies said, you know, you finally opened her heart again. She realized, wow, I was raised by monsters, and then I became one. That was her realization. Nobody told her to think that. She just saw what happened to her. Now, one of the beauties of who we are as human beings is that on a certain level, we negotiate the conditions in our life for evolution before we take on a body, and we negotiate on some level who we are in terms of our genetic predispositions. And so we got to start somewhere. And so as the person begins to become conscious and awake and they start realizing, wow, this isn't love, you know, being treated this way, being manipulated this way, being dysfunctional in this way, living in this environment really isn't what the definition of love that I'm searching for is. That doesn't mean you just start thinking positively and you don't address the issue. Now, I'm going to answer the question now that I've given the basis foundation in two ways. There are great therapies in energy the psychology and Liz, who's on this call, happens to know a lot about this because she runs the organization in France and things like EMDR, things like EFT, body talk, these things that are dealing somatically with the program subconsciously that's stored in the body has produced tremendous changes in people's cortisol levels, tremendous changes in their health, tremendous changes in their memory of the event or the past without the emotional charge. And as an example, EMDR is a great way to consolidate those memories and turn them into wisdom, to look at them and see the charge that goes along with them. And then through a process of doing a few things, in time you begin to lower the volume to that emotion and you get to see your past through a different lens and that's when you begin to change. Now, some people need that kind of help and yet by the same means in the work that we do here, a lot of people you know, have to come up against a lot of past memories and a lot of dysfunction that seems very confusing. Now, you never hear me say, go to the past event and analyze it. I will never tell anybody to do that because I know it doesn't work. What I do know that works, as I said to Matt, is to overcome the emotion. And I can tell you from just interviewing people that were in dysfunctional households and dysfunctional families, abusive relationships, 
abusive parents violated in all kinds of ways that had all kinds of health conditions that were suicidal, that had night terrors, the whole bit. They hung in there. And when they thought they were doing their meditation wrong because all of this was coming up, they were actually doing it right. And when you open that door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, a lot of times you open up Pandora's box and people would rather just not sit through it to see what's on the other side. And yet people would say it was the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. And I just thought about all those times that I did the work and I hadn't missed a day and I was going to give up. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm just going to go one more time. I'm just going to go a little further. And that's the end right there. That's the edge of what they know. And the unknown just seems to be a whole lot more scary, but they can't cling to the known any longer, so they let go. And the words that they use is, my heart blew wide open. It was like my heart exploded. These are words that they use, and they look back at their past, and for some reason, they see it like it was exactly the way it's supposed to be because it brought them to the present moment. In fact, they don't want to change anything in their past because... They gain the, the understanding at that point, and that's the moment their disease goes away. That's the moment they have nothing but love for their betrayers because they were part of what they needed to learn to get to this elegant moment that they had never felt before in their entire life. That's when it becomes instrumental. Now, that's the antidote, but by the same means, if you're living in conditions with a dysfunctional family, you have the same two choices. You either get professional help to have somebody who's outside the culture of the family to help the family in a certain way to change. Every single one of them has to change in the dysfunctional family. The responses, the behaviors, everything has to change. You need someone who's outside the culture of the family to be able to do that. And that's point one. The other point is you got to ask yourself, what is loving to me? And this is an important question that we all have to ask. And, and when we ask the question, what is loving to me? If living in a dysfunctional family brings you pain and sorrow and suffering every single day, and you can't get the help that you need, and you're an adult that can make a different choice, you have one of two choices. You either work on mastering the environment and making those changes yourself, or you, you separate yourself from those conditions and you have a place to go where you have the solitude to be able to gather your thoughts, the solitude to be able to change your emotional state, the solitude to be able to think about how you want to behave with your family when you're back with them. And I think that is also very healthy. Now, it's so much easier said than done because some people have limitations, whether it's financial, whether it's co-parenting, whatever that is. What I will tell you, though, based on talking to enough people that have had breakthroughs in their life by changing themselves, is that when they truly changed, when they truly, truly, truly decided to do the work and decided to make those changes, their response to the people in their life were different. Everything started to change. And some of those people that were abusive, some of those people that were unhappy, some of those people that had addictions or certain problems they started to want to have help as well. They really started to really sincerely want to change also. And so by us being able to monitor our responses and our habituations and reactions to those conditions, it takes a tremendous amount of, as I said, energy and a tremendous amount of presence to be able to do it. And so there is very, very deep roots that we have to family. And it's a fast path to enlightenment because family at certain times shows us or reflects to us things about us that are very close to us. And gosh, if we can love our family in a healthy way or we come from a loving family, we're super lucky. But many people have very challenging and difficult situations in making the choice for change in any way that you decide to do it is laying down the familiar known, the abuse, the conditions that seem to never change, even though the person wants to change, they just can't help themselves. And sometimes they need help. And so consider both options, either getting help from outside the culture of the family, or really isolating yourself from those conditions, or at least work on having a place where you can go and change your state and change your response and see if that changes. And Give yourself a period of time. I'm going to try this out for a month. It's, a, it's an experiment. And if it doesn't change sincerely and mark that date as an important date, then you got to make a better choice. You got to make a bigger choice. And I think just from my own observation and my own experience, 
if you do decide to make a different choice and step out of the known into the unknown, I think everybody benefits from it, even though there's a little chaos and a little disorder up until that point. It's interesting to note that Dr. Joe would never say to go back and analyze past trauma and negative events because that doesn't work. But with a healing modality like EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, or EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques, you can heal the emotional pain from past events. EFT is about the mind-body connection, so every negative event from the past has an emotional charge to it. And whenever you do EFT, what it does is it helps you remove that emotional charge uh, almost instantly. It's really quite amazing. EFT can remove all of the emotional pain and leave you feeling emotional freedom, hence the name Emotional Freedom Techniques. The bottom line is that we must forgive those who portrayed, betrayed us in the past. We must forgive ourselves and we, we must forgive the event, the circumstance, or the situation of what happened to us. It's happened to all of us. That's the work. You wouldn't be the person who you are now without those bad events. You can use tools like EMDR and EFT and meditation to do that so that one day you too can feel and really mean it that you have nothing but love for your betrayers. If you like this video, please like, hit the like button and subscribe. And if you feel like leaving a comment below, please do so. And now go out and, and create a great day or night. Thank you.